Hello and welcome to my Moana lecture series. I'm Nick Lugo and I will be taking you through, well, essentially the whole Moana story and hopefully, hopefully by the end you'll be able to learn something from it. Hopefully you'll be able to gain some sort of life lesson, some sort of understanding of well, not just Moana psychology, but human psychology in general. You know, there's something, we'll say, special in the story of Moana, and that's probably why you clicked. And, um, and well, the whole purpose is to help explain what is so special about Moana, because this movie really, it moved me, and I was, I was very surprised. So, well, Part of this lecture series is going to be me understanding a little bit more why I liked Moana, what was so good about Moana, and what lessons it really, well, what it reveals about myself, and then what I can learn from it. So, um, well, let me start off, start you off with the actual theory, right? The actual understanding as to why I'm doing these lectures and what you could actually gain from these lectures. So, the first thing that I really want to, well, convey to you is like, you know, Moana is you right? When you think of yourself watching a story, right? Whenever you think of yourself watching a movie, there's a crazy phenomenon that actually happens where we take ourselves, we take the, well, we'll say the person that we know and, um, and we place ourselves like, like an avatar sort of in a, in Moana's place. So whenever we're watching Moana, it's not as if we're like a passive viewer sort of, you know, watching the movie screen it's as if we are stepping inside the movie screen and we ourselves are moana and every time moana goes through some sort of hardship we feel it and every time moana goes through some sort of you know um triumph we also feel it and um well it just shows we identify with these characters you know like there's a reason you know there are how many movies that were made over the last X amount of, you know, over the last year, right? But how many of them did you really, well, first of all, watch, because most people said, I really don't like this, and I didn't identify with the characters at all. And out of how many of the movies do you say, wow, that was a really, really good movie? There was something about it that just made me awestruck and made me in it, right? I just felt like I was in it, and it was an emotional roller coaster, you could say, right? And, um, and while that happens when you literally place yourself inside of the story, you identify so much with the characters. And, well, for example, if you watch Moana, right, then there's a good chance you might not have identified with a character like, I don't know, Thor, right, from a completely different archetype, completely different series, right, or pick another one, right? Like any other character, there's some reason why you identified with Moana, and, um, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to, you know, you'll be able to relate this back to your own life because maybe, maybe, just maybe you identified with Moana because you have so many similarities to Moana that, um, that you find out that Moana is you and you could, that right now you are going on the same path that Moana is going on and maybe you can, well, succeed like she did. And, um. Well, that's good for now. That's so hopefully, you know, at the end of this is a challenge, right? This is really just a challenge to see whether or not you actually could learn something from this because you know, I think I think there's a there's a real problem that I see amongst amongst people who watch movies is that they they look at these movies and they say it was just a movie, right? Like you watch the two hour movie and then you say, okay, there's really nothing behind this. I just kind of, well, I enjoyed it, right? And um, well, the problem is that's wrong. Like it's, it's completely wrong. Like humans are designed to learn from stories and humans are designed to be able to get something out of it and to actually integrate it into their lives. You know, if I, if I tell you a story about how I, you know, well, more of like a autobiography, right? Like if I, if I tell you how I triumphed, automatically your brain is sort of sifting through and saying, all right, he did that and it went really, really well. How can I do that in my own life? Right? Because you take the lessons of the, well, the successful people, hopefully, and you apply them to your life. What is the difference between this and Moana? Right? Moana, 
if you identify so much with this character, if you find her so, we'll say, similar to you in a way, which you will, <laughs> then, um, then you'll find that a lot of the things that she learned and a lot of the successful things that she did, you'll be able to apply to your, your life. Doesn't matter if she's fictional or not. You think about the amount of people that were influenced by, we'll say, Harry Potter, um, Luke Skywalker, or Iron Man, right? The amount of people that are influenced by them. And, you know, that's the Disney princess phenomenon where all these, you know, little girls want to dress up as Disney princesses, even though they're fictional characters. G.I. Joe, it's the same thing, you know? And, um, well, it's the same thing with the with the story of Jesus, right? You look at someone like Jesus and you say, was he real? Did he actually exist? And to some degree, the answer is we don't care. We don't care whether or not he exists. He exists within us, right? He, he seems real to us. And that's really all that matters because we get to learn from him that way. And, um, and therefore, Moana is you. And therefore, you could use the even a fictional character to learn from. Then uh, the next lesson to, well, understand, well, if Moana is you and you're stepping into the frame, then this is your universe, right? This world is your world. And, um, and you'll, see that, you'll see that play out as you go along. So let's start with, well, Moana's birth, right? Let's start with the origin of this universe. So actually, no, this is before Moana's birth. This is literally the origin of Moana's world, which is in this case, because we are identifying with it, this is your world. And um, it starts with the story of a goddess. And, um, and it's funny because whenever we do these, you know, whenever, whenever a movie starts with an origin story, it's almost as if they're creating their own religion. Right? It's, it's almost as if, because they're literally creating their own theory on how the world begins. You know, like there's the, um, well, for example, this movie, they say, I think it was in the beginning, there was only ocean, right? The, the opening to the Bible is in the beginning, there was the word, right? And then you establish a completely new world and a completely new life philosophy from that. And well, it's like the, 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 the fact that every, almost all of these hero movies establish some sort of, you know, life religion, you know, some way of living is, um, is it somewhat baffles me, but I, I really like it. And You'll see, you'll see the parallels that exist as we go along. So there's this goddess, right? This goddess that um, essentially began the world. You could think of her as God because she essentially is a god, right? They call her, they even call her a goddess at the end. And um, you could think of her as Mother Earth too, because um, because she essentially created the well land, right? So she created. You imagine when they say in the beginning, in the beginning, there was only ocean. The reason why they say that is because in the beginning, well, imagine living in ocean, right? That's complete chaos. That's, that's, you drown, right? Like you imagine you can't, you can't live on ocean. So what happens is, um, let me see if I can, no, no. So what happens is God, right? Who in this case is, um, is mother earth pulls up land to give people a place to live, right? To give people order that emerges out of the chaos. And that's the, well, that's the fundamental feminine archetype, right? Like the order was birthed out of chaos, out of mother. And, um, well, if you look at like agricultural tribes in the, like, you know, how many thousands of years ago, you know, what their mythology was strictly based off of was they viewed the well they were the ones who created the mother earth you know idea and the mother earth idea essentially says wait a second we plant a seed right a crop and um and then it turns into food who should i thank for this right who is giving me life and then they look around and they say wait a second the sun's also shining and and i have land to stand on and i have water to drink I'm going to say the person who birthed this food out of the ground is is Mother Earth, right? Is the goddess that I'm going to support. And that's, that's well, that's what's so special about Mother Earth. And you'll see the only problem with Mother Earth is that there's two sides of her, right? The problem with Mother Earth is that you have the person who creates land, but also the person who 
brings tornadoes and earthquakes and, you know, it's the bringer of life and also the bringer of death. So, uh, you watch, I think it's really funny, you got someone like Moana and she's just, you know, well, crushed by it, right? Like, she, she's, she's loving it and all the other kids are, well, they're not loving it. So, you, um, you, well, so the rest of the story goes that you have this essential god, right? His name is Maui and he removes the heart from, from God, right? He removes the essence from God and he wants to give it to the people. So if we're going to, well, I'll explain it to you in a, in, a, in another story that might make a little bit more sense, you know? So the way, the way, have you ever heard of the story of the goose and the golden egg, right? The story of the goose and the golden egg is super simple. It's a farmer. It's a fairy tale. He goes out, is it a fairy tale? I don't know, but he goes out one day and, um, and he goes to his geese and he goes to collect their eggs. And one day he finds that one of the eggs made from one of the geese is full of solid gold. And he looks at it. He's like, wow, I could essentially make my entire living off this. I don't have to be a farmer anymore. I don't have to struggle for food. Like there's really no more problems that I, that I have anymore with this egg. And then he goes and he sells it and he makes a little money. And then he comes back the next day and the geese laid another golden egg, the goose. And, um... And he says, wow, if I get an egg every single day, I could buy a mansion. I could, I could be, you know, essential, maybe, maybe something like a God because, well, I could make all the money in the world. And, um, well, he does this, he starts to build up his property, starts to build up his land. And, um, and then one day he says, wait a second, inside the geese, there's gotta be more eggs. There's gotta be more eggs because, well, where did they come from? They're, they're already inside of them. So what he does is. He kills the goose, and um, and he opens them up, and he goes for the eggs, and um, and there are no eggs, right? And what happens is when you when you remove the, well, yeah. So when he killed the goose, there's no there's no value that you get from it, and the and the the meaning behind that is when you remove the source of life, when you remove the source of, um we'll say value, but, but a little bit deeper, you know, if you think of gold as something a little bit more, more real, right? If you think of gold as something like a spiritual desire, you could say, or some sort of fundamental need, then, um, if you remove that source, then you lose, you lose the, the life that comes with it. And this is what happens with, um, well, it's greed, right? It's greed. Greed is the problem or, you know, some sort of, we'll say, egotistical desire of humans. And this is what Maui is. And we find out that he is a very strong ego. And, um, and what ends up happening is he got carried away, right? He gets carried away. And this is the same thing as uh, the story of the Midas Touch, right? The story of the Midas Touch is you get a, uh, a King Midas goes up to the gods and says, I want to turn everything into money. I want to be the money king, you could say, right? And, um, and I want, he says, I want to turn everything into gold. So he touches his laptop here, turns into gold, touches his microphone, turns into gold, touches his pole, it turns into gold. And, um, and he's happy, right? Everything's going well, you know, just like, just like the go the guy who's collecting the, the golden eggs from the goose. And then what happens is he touches one of his loved ones and she turns into gold. And then he realizes He's like, wait a second, I have, I have removed myself from life itself. In my, in, my, in my desire to be greater than life itself, I have removed my, um, well, I have lost my life, right? I have lost the life that exists within it. And, well, then he goes back to the gods and he says, can you reverse the curse? And they say, okay, fine, king. So, um... Well, so let me explain what that means in in real terms to see if we could to see if we could take it and and pull it down a little bit. So you know, so it's not just completely abstract. The reason behind it is, um, well, you would imagine, obviously, remove. So removing the stone is ego, and the goddess herself is life, right? She's Mother Earth. She's God, and um, and well, the meaning behind that is. 
when humans, right, if this is an origin story, when humans developed an ego, when humans developed, we'll say, rationality, logic, um, self-interest in a, in a more, I guess, non-spiritual sense, and, um, and the need for recognition, you know, all these, all these, we'll say, like, the need for fame, which is like, it's a desire, but it's not really the desire you want, you know, and greed, you know, when we developed these things, Every single one of them detaches you from life itself. You know, you ever hear of the story of somebody who makes all the money in the world but isn't happy? It's because they, well, yeah, yeah, they've detached from life. They've detached from the spiritual things that will make them happy, like family, relationships, um, you know, family, relationships, spirituality, religion, and, you know, essentially the good parts of life, the parts that just make you feel meaningful and they've just gone off to go for money. And when you do something like that, you detach from life itself. And this is what the meaning of taking the, um, taking the, the stone is. And then, well, there's another problem. The other problem is what happens when you, well, so, so let's say this, let's say that our society lives in a two, our society lives in a society, sure, that is too rational. We are too rational, and we have detached ourselves from life. That is what they are saying, and that is something that I would completely agree with. Like, you imagine, we'll say, well, we'll come up with multiple examples. First, greed, right? That makes sense. What about when you get into an argument? When you get into an argument, what is the goal of the argument? Is the goal of the argument, and... I'm too guilty of this. Getting into an argument. Is the goal of the argument to win the argument or is the goal of the argument to sort out your problems with the other person, right? So the question is, is your goal to have a deeper connection with that person, right? And strive towards that goal or is your goal to win, which is in service of your ego, right? And well, most people, if we're talking about how they behave, they just get super defensive and... Um, and lose and and win but they lose right and that's you know i'm way too guilty of that you know that's that's the rational logical society and then you ask you know what happens when you well we'll say what happens when you pursue pleasure right when you pursue well here's here's a good example you spend two hours we'll say just like scrolling through instagram right you imagine there's life that exists outside of there. There's beauty that exists outside of there. But for whatever reason, we actually look like Maui. That's funny. We actually look like Maui holding our phones and he, like he's holding the stone and just, you know, like reveling in this, in this pleasure, reveling in this, you know, sort of weird thing that detaches us from life. And, um, and you could, you could say the same thing with food. You could say the same thing with whatever, right? Like, you you detach yourself from life itself when you search for these weird desires that have nothing to do with obtaining well something more meaningful right like i think i think the goal of every person in life is to attain something meaningful imagine yourself on your deathbed this is what i talked about in my book imagine yourself on your deathbed and um you complaining about whether or not, you know, whether or not you get some chicken tonight or, you know, whether or not you get a donut at the end or whether you say you didn't get enough donuts or you didn't spend enough time on social media, right? I think we all realize somewhere that, um, that life is all about how meaningful, how meaningful it is. And even if, even for the people who say like, I want to have the best experience possible, right? They're not talking about just getting blackout drunk and not speaking to anybody and sitting in a corner, you know, it's, it's sharing meaningful moments with meaningful people. And, um, and what now he's doing is he's detaching from that. Now, what is the result, right? What, what is the result according to Moana? And this is, you know, genuine psychological theory is, um, when you pull out from life itself, you experience a backlash, let's say. So you see someone like Tikka, right? We'll, we'll go first, we'll start with Moana. And, um, and he's got to confront this beast, right? And, um, and it really shows, right? So once he removed the heart, then there was someone, 
well, we know, right? Hopefully, if you watch Moana, right? Then the beast, the the goddess turned into a beast, right? And then what happens is this is angry, furious, um, we'll say impulsive and desires to hurt other people, right? Like that that's really the goal of Teka. And um, well, let me give you this in a social example. I'm, I'm reading this book right now. It's called, um, it's called, uh, the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and what he talks about is what happened in Russia in the 20th century, where, well, the Soviet Union in the 20th century, where, when they essentially, like, under Stalin, right? And what well, we could say that Stalin is sort of like a Tekka, right? Or, no, Stalin is more of like a Maui, right? He's more of like a egotistical, um, egotistical guy who's willing to remove the necessities of life to achieve his purpose, right? To achieve whatever goal he's trying to do. And what happened was he wanted to execute the Kulaks. The Kulaks were just a group of farmers and they were just very, very rich, right? And they were very rich and they did very well. And, um, and well, under the communist system, they wanted everyone to be equal. And therefore you got to take out some of the rich people, right? And it's a little bit more deep than that, but that's essentially what happened. And, um, and they killed, a, it was somewhere between 600,000 to 5 million kulaks that were executed for nothing besides just being kulaks. And, um, and you could say that is the removal of life, right? That is the removal of the life within your society. That is the removal of life within your world. And what happened? A famine, right? Of course, of course the famine is going to result because they removed the farmers, right? They removed the people who were giving your city life and, um... And Russia was hit by one of the worst famines that they, you know, that you could imagine. And they essentially had to give rations to everybody and people died, right? So the famine is represented by Teka. So, um, so it's like you look at, you look at a story like this and you say, why does, why does a goddess turn into this beast? And well, maybe it just makes sense, right? Like nobody, I don't think we ever questioned the fact that, that they turn in, that the goddess turns into Teka. Like that was never a question. We never wondered that, but it just makes sense because we understand how this acts. And I mean, you could take this in your own life. You know, Carl Jung, he said, it's funny because, well, you could say the part of, you, the part of our unconscious that exists, right? So you imagine there's your conscious experience. It's the way you view the world and the way that you understand the world. Then the things that lie below are your unconscious thoughts, right? So, you know, um, desires, um, desires as well as divinity, right? So for example, well, let's, let's just start this way, you know, when you go to eat food, right? And you are, you know, that food's bad for you. It's not like you are motivated by your conscious desires. It's you're motivated by your unconscious desires. I think that's that's something we understand. Now, when you're motivated by the spirit, right? Someone like a Jesus character, someone like a well, let me give you a better let me give you an example of when you're motivated by by the spirit. When you say, I want to go to the gym, right? I I, I want to start eating healthier, right? I want to go to the gym. And I am going to do whatever it takes to get there. So maybe, you know, you start saying, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. You know, I'm going to, I'll do some push-ups every single day. I'm going to go to the gym for two hours. I'm going to start going on a run, you know, and you're hit by this fit of passion. That's so awesome. You know, that, um, that's like the, the new year's resolution passion that really comes. And, um, and well, you got to ask the question, what is driving you there? It's not rationality. It's not rationality because it's it's coming up from you and this passion is really what's driving you. And you could say, that's the goddess, right? You're driven by the spirit. You're driven by your, well, you could say your internal flame. And, um, and that's, that's unconscious too. So you could say unconscious could be represented by this and this, both. And, um, well, it's just a matter of which one you like. So, so let's take the example of food because food is the most simple form of life. You know, food gives you energy, energy gives you life. So you eat food and let's say you're eating food in a good way, right? And by eating food in a good way, I mean you're eating it because it fulfills your desire for life, which is the essential need of food, we could say. 
So you eat food. It um, maybe it's not just like it has no influence on you. Maybe you like it, but 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 it, it serves a good purpose, right? And that is the representation of the goddess, right? Within you, right? The goddess. You could imagine like the devil and the angel on your shoulders. This is the goddess on your shoulders saying, you could eat this, whatever, we'll say chicken, and it, 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 it's life nourishing. It gives you food, right? But what happens when you eat a donut, right? When you are literally just eating food for pleasure purposes, right? For the purpose of well, impulse, right? Because teka is the representation of impulse. And <laughs> it's funny, the best representation that, I, that you could have of this is diet Coke or diet whatever, right? Because the thing about diet is, well, it has no calories, right? It has no life, right? There's, there's no energy that it gives you. The only thing that it gives you is pleasure, right? And that's a representation of teka. It gives you impulse. It gives you, um, well, the satisfaction of impulse, and, um, <laughs> well, that's just the funny thing. When you, when you drink Diet Coke, you are removing the life from food. You are removing the, the, the nurturing aspect of food and you're just doing it straight for pleasure. And that's what Teka is. So the, um, the, the full representation here, if we were to put all those pieces together, it says that humans as well as societies right with the kulaks and as well as well you know all structures have the ability to become corrupt we have the ability to start out with with good intentions good desires this food is this food is worthy this food gives me life and then um or or maybe like you have someone like maui who says wait a second you know i'm getting i'm getting um i'm getting gold from this you know, essentially, I'm getting gold from this um, from this egg, right? And there's really no harm in it. But the problem is when it becomes corrupt, when it destroys the life within it, and we essentially pull ourselves out of well the meaning behind it, then we fall apart, right? Then we have this backlash effect, which is take off, and. Um, well, this a good example of this. A good example of this is anxiety, right? I think I think this is probably the this is definitely the best example. The best example is you take you take something like anxiety. What is anxiety? It is emotions, right? The re really what anxiety is is you imagine you have like one problem going wrong in your life, and um and you don't really handle it, so you just kind of like deal with it. Maybe you're having like a problem with your friend. And then you have like two more problems that exist and you still don't want to handle it. You just kind of push them to the side. And then you get like three or four more problems because if we're, if we're real, right, if we're really understanding life, life is just full of problems. That's exactly what it is if you don't handle them. Well, imagine you have like seven, eight problems and instead of handling them as they come up, you, you just sort of bottle them up. Right, and that's that's essentially repressing your emotions. So when you when you bottle up an emotion, what's happening? You see this emotion and you say, Okay, my body is trying to tell me something. Right? There is something that my that my mind, that my body, that my you could say spirit is trying to tell me. But I'm just gonna push it down. I'm gonna remove the life from it. I'm gonna extract the um the emotions. I'm just gonna push it down. And then you keep doing it, and by the time you hit, we'll say, eight, right? And then you look around and you realize how many problems you have that you haven't solved. Well, it's almost as if you bottled up your emotions. It's almost as if you bottled up all of your problems, right? Because that's exactly what you did, and then it explodes, and you get teka, right? And that teka would be a representation of anxiety attack, right? Because that's exactly what she is, impulsive, angry, and... um. And yeah, impulsive and angry. And it's because you removed life itself, right? It's because you you ignored life. And um and well what so then what what do humans and this this is the well so one of the best parts about Moana, right, is that it also says the fundamental problem in humans, and this is the next slide. What happens is Maui, right, we could say he's a symbol of the ego, says, I'm gonna take him down. I'm strong enough. I could take down my emotions, 
right? I could, I could conquer my emotions, and he gets crushed, right? He gets crushed. He loses his hook, and he loses his, uh, he loses the stone. And what is the meaning behind that? The meaning behind that is whenever, let's say, let's go with the example of anxiety, right? If Maui is a symbol of ego, and Teka is a symbol of animalistic impulse, them confronting it is literally what you do when you, um, when you push down your emotions. You say, I have this emotion, I have this, this feeling of anger that exists within me, or this feeling of, we'll say, um, well, maybe it's desire, maybe it's um, impulse, whatever it is, I'm just gonna push it down, right? You're essentially saying, I'm gonna use my ego, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use my rational, logical brain, my willpower to just push it down, to just push it down. And that's this fight right here. That's this fight. Maui is you saying, I don't really need to worry about that right now. That's really not a big deal. And the problem is you lose every time. You lose every time because you get this bottling up effect. Because you, well, you might not know it. You might not realize it. But after a while, you realize you separated from life itself. And that is the fundamental problem of humans, according to Moana, right? The fundamental problem of humans is that we believe that we can solve everything and control everything. Let me see if, let me see if I can find a good example. Here, we'll go with the example of working out. So there was a study that was done. They brought in a bunch of college students, and this, um, they asked them, they said, how many hours do you expect to work out this month? And the answer was 20 on average. You get 20. And hey, listen, that's a good goal, right? Working out 20 hours this month. They bring them back a month later and they say, how many hours did you actually work out? And the answer was six. So clearly on average, they missed their goals, right? On average, they, they got 30% of their goal. Now you could say that this was a failure of the ego, right? The ego said, I want 20, right? Willpower said, I want 20 hours. But this unconscious brain, Teka, right? This, if, if Teka is a symbol for animalistic pleasure, then, um, well, Teka said, we'll say maybe four. And then, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they want a little bit, but clearly the ego, right? Clearly the person who said 20 got crushed, got destroyed, just like Maui right? Just like Maui. Then here's the most interesting part. <laughs> this is what makes the study so great. In that same meeting where they said, how many hours did you actually work out? And when they said six, they also asked them, how many hours do you plan? What is your goal for working out next month? And um, well, guess what their answer is? It was 25 on average. 25 right? So instead of compromising, instead of working with our, um, our unconscious, instead of working with our animal side and sort of, you know, we'll say, well, that's the theory behind it, but, but understanding it a little bit more and trying to work with it, we say right away, let's fight. Let's do it. Let's, I am going to be this little man versus this giant God which is, you know, we'll say in this case, it's the desire to sit on the couch and scroll on and scroll on social media and watch Netflix, right? Like that's, this, this is the strong desire that exists within us versus our little willpower who's saying, I can do it. I can do it. And well, we say 25 and we fail because by saying 25, you're saying I failed last month. But I'm going to up the ante a little bit and maybe that's going to help. It's like, no, it's not. There's, there's no way that that's going to help. And I've gone through so many of those personal experiments in my life. So many times I said, oh yeah, you know, I didn't get my 10 push-ups today, whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to do 20 tomorrow, right? To make up for it. And then you just go to do your 20 push-ups and it just doesn't happen. It's a flawed mindset. It's a flawed way of thinking to believe that you, that your little rationality, logic, like the little the little you know, um, we'll say power that you have over your unconscious, is going to get you to twenty five hours a week. It's impossible. It's impossible. Or we'll say almost impossible. And well, well, that's the flaw. We fail, right? We fail. And um.
And if we're going to talk about this is this is very representation of the representative of the Adam and Eve story. This is essentially original sin, right? This is the um, the fundamental flaw of humans. So we um, we go back and we find <laughs> it's funny. It's like guess which one Moana is, right? You know, clearly, clearly, you know, she's she's the one who's most interested. Clearly, there's something special in her, you could say. And we go a little further, and. You see, it's so funny. So the person who told the story is the lady on the left, right? It's like the crazy grandma, the crazy spiritual lady, you could say. And um, and he picks up Moana, right? And and his her dad picks up Moana and says, "No one goes outside the reef. We don't do that, right? Don't don't listen to these stupid stories. Don't listen to these um, things that are illogical." And um, well, it's funny because the dad is the representation of the flaw in humans. He's the representation of the rational, the rational, um, well, rationality, right, in general, and um, being cautious, right? Because he believes that you don't need, right? You don't need to step outside of the barriers. You don't need to step out of outside of your known area. You don't need to, we'll say, connect with God, right? So he says, essentially, you don't need to connect with God, but you also don't need to connect with Teka. Just stay away from it. Just don't even worry about it. And, um, and he's the problem, right? He's the problem because he believes that, well, he believes that you could solve the problem of life by avoiding it with rationality, right? Because it's rational not to face Teka, right? Like it's rational because someone like Maui lost, right? It's rational not to, we'll say, go deeper into, well, understanding your motivations, right? Understanding your drives because, well, if we were to look at this from a from a humanistic perspective, maybe, maybe um take ha represents one of your drives right like 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 we said the drive to sit on the couch we'll say and um and he's the problem because he just says no it's okay Let, let's just be let's just use our rationality let's just use our logic and um and let's just use our will and we'll just we'll just sort of push through it which is you know the original sin so now you realize that original sin the the, the fundamental problem of humans is present in everyday society right and that's true it's true in all domains because we always have problems and we always have we'll say natural flaws that exist within us right our natural flaw is well we'll say two natural flaws the first natural flaw is that we believe that we could face our um we could face our unconscious and the second one is we believe that we are well well, we have this tendency to detach from life itself. We have this tendency to separate. And um, and that's what, that's what the chief is, right? That's what her father is. He's detached from life itself. All he cares about is rationality and safety. And, um, and that's it, right? And, and being safe and keeping everyone safe. But he doesn't care about life itself. And one of the greatest metaphors that I that I could use for this is um is is the metaphor of the tree. I really like this. They they said this in Titanic, and I I spent a lot of time thinking about this. It's it's a rootless existence. The the phrase rootless existence. What does that mean? That means that you are a tree, right? And you've detached from your roots. And um, well, that's exactly what this story is. That's exactly what this story is. You know, you imagine, um, right, you have this Mother Earth figure, then you have Maui detaching from the roots, detaching from the roots of life. You know, the things that keep you grounded, the things that keep you fulfilled, right? And, um, and then you imagine your tree now is could be easily swayed right it could be easily swayed and it eventually falls over and that's what happens in this society right what happens is they have no spiritual roots this group they are strictly rationality they are strictly logic and um 
And the problem is they don't have any roots. So we'll see how that plays out. And, um, well, it's also deceptive, right? That, that's the biggest problem. It's very deceptive because it looks really nice, right? It looks really nice. It's essentially paradise if we were to, if we were to say it like that. And, um, and it's a good question. It's like, why should, why should you leave something that's so good? Why should you leave something that's so safe and secure? Because that's exactly what, um, what Moana's dad is telling her, right? It's safe and secure. Why would you want to leave? But at the same time, darkness lurks. That's why. And, and you'll see that come along. So, um, so you have this moment where, you know, it's sort of like a dreamlike fashion. Actually, I actually really like this. But, you know, it's really the initial show of strength. It's like, why should Moana be the chosen one, you could say? Why should you be the chosen one? And um, it seems like the answer is compassion. Right. There's something there's something compassionate in her, you know, even as obviously as a kid, she's just, you know, bringing this little turtle into the water and um, and the water kind of opens up for her and the stone. Right. The stone is right there. Right. And um, and it sort of calls from her and. Well. You could think of that as desire. Right, you think of that as the desire to explore. You know, there's this. It, it's pretty true across all mythology, all movies. I I always see this. It's a constant thing where, well, for Harry Potter, for example, right, his wand chose him, right? Like, like he didn't get to choose his wand. His wand chose him. He didn't choose to be a wizard. Somebody just comes up to him and says, "You're a wizard, Harry." You know, and the same thing with um. With Luke Skywalker, right? Like he just comes in and just like, you know, you're Darth Vader's kid. You gotta do it. Right? Like you you have this power within you. Same thing for his son, Anakin, you know, like like Darth Vader himself. He was he was born um he was born and he had the highest amount of, we'll say like force, which is many chlorines within him, right? And it's it's almost as if God chose him. And well that's a good that's a good understanding because when you think about it, God chose you. Right? God chose you to live, God chose you to exist, and God chose you to, well, go on whatever mission you need to go on. And what that usually means is to follow your heart in a general sense, you know, follow your dreams. And, um, and the answer is God chose you, right? And you don't, you, it doesn't need to be God because this isn't really like a a Christian religious movie. It's it's very far from it, actually. But you could say the spirit chose you, right? Whatever you want to believe. But um, but there's something meaningful about you being on this world, and you have some sort of mission to do, right? Some mission, and also I like this: some mission that is unique to you, right? It's not it's not like someone else could do the th thing that you can do. It's like, no, you have a specific mission, you know, whatever it is, you were put on this earth for some reason. And that's the representation of, you know, the, the heart choosing her. And, um, well, that's about right. And it also shows, it's also cool because, you know, when you're a kid, and, um, well, I hate saying when you're a kid because we're always a kid, right? We're always, we're always searching for goals. We're always striving for goals. So we'll even use the, we'll use a, a five-year-old and then we'll use a 40-year-old and it's the same thing. For the five-year-old, he grows up, he looks up and he says, wow, I want to cure cancer. I want to do it. I want to be the person who cures cancer. And, um, well, that's the representation of seeing the heart, right? Like Moana is looking into her potential. That's that's the coolest part, right? So this this heart is revealing itself to her, but she doesn't get to touch it, right? And that's that's sort of like the idea of following your heart, you know? Because as a kid, right, you are you see the person that you could be, right? You you look and well, you realize that you are complete potential, right? There is nothing about you that is nothing about you that is good right now. 
The only thing that's good about you is that you could be good, right? You could become the worst drug criminal ever, but you also could cure cancer. And there's that, there's that possibility, right? And the best part about being a kid and the best part about goals in general is that you get to see it, right? You literally get to face it. And like, I could imagine right now, if I want to look into my goal and my goal is probably to, we'll say, well, discover as much of myself as possible. That's, that's a good goal. I, I could see myself right now looking at a fully developed me, right? And I could see myself, you know, this is something that I often do. I often imagine, right, me going and we'll say sharing my wisdom with the world, right? My, my newly found wisdom, probably like, I'm probably like 50, 50 to 70 years old in this dream. I would say probably like 65 and I get to see it, right? I could actually imagine myself and it's a little bit blurry, but I could actually see it. And, um, and that's what Moana sees, right? Like you could actually look into the future and then you could also kind of map out and say, okay, this is the path that I need to go on to get there. And, um, and that's so weird. That's so weird. Humans are the only people who could do that. We could actually see, okay, first of all, I see that path and I could go there, but I also see the path of what's going to be the thing that brings me to be a drug lord, right? What's the thing that's going to lead me to whatever, right? The for me, for me, the thing that I hate the most is like an office job, right? So, you know, what's going to be the thing that leads me to an office job? And I say, I don't do this and I do this. And I imagine myself in all these potential scenarios, all these, um, well, all these potentials of life. And that's what Moana sees. Moana sees, I could cure cancer. That's what that says, right? Or I could, I could go to, go to the moon, right? There's, there's that thing or I could follow my heart more generally. I could wish upon a star, right? As Disney would say. And um, and well, that's that's the best part. You don't you don't get it, right? So the the thing shows itself to her. The the stone shows itself to her, and then it leaves because well, that's exactly what it is. She didn't get it yet. She doesn't. She doesn't. She hasn't achieved it yet. But at the same time, she has the potential to, and she she faces it. You could see that with a forty year old. You know, forty year old. Um, well. 40 year old, we'll say 30 year old trying to chase a goal, right? So imagine it's a funny stat that 20, at 29, that is the year that most people, that you are most likely to run a marathon, run your first marathon, 29. You got to ask the question, why 29? It's because you realize at the end of your 29 years of life and at the end of your 20s, which, you know, most, the, it's funny because the biggest regret of the people who are 30 is that they didn't work hard enough in their 20s, you know? So, for the people who are 39 or 29, they are realizing that their youth is ending and they don't have that many goals, right? They don't really know what to do and they're, they're almost detaching from life. And, um, well, in my opinion, that's, that's the representation of an, of an office job. But anyways, what they do is they say, I want to set a goal. I want to set a meaningful goal to show myself that I could do it. And what is the goal, Right it's the pearl, right? It's the, it's the stone. And that's, that's exactly what it is. It's you look into the future and you say, can I run 26.2 miles? And you say, maybe, maybe I could run 26.2 miles, but that's all you need, right? You imagine yourself crossing the finish line and that's the, that's the goal itself. So you say, you know, I say as a child, we do this, but we do this for every single goal that we set. We look into the future and we say, this is something that I could achieve. And this is something that I want to achieve. And then we say, now let's take the steps to do it. So, um, so Moana does, right? She does, and she she grows up, and um, actually, is that a good place to stop? Yeah, that's a good place to stop.